Um, so we have, um, many of you may have met Colleen um, from her presentation on our first night, uh, but we're honored to have her uh, talk with three experts about training the next generation of chefs. And so I'll let Colleen introduce her panelists. Hi, everybody. Yeah, those will me again. Uh, I was extremely honored and thrilled to be asked to moderate this panel, and I promise that I'm not going to disappear like Lester Holt did last night. Um, <clears throat> Burn. We had to have one, and you knew it was going to come from me. Um, I'm kind of an unlikely person to be standing here talking about whole grains. Um, I am a graduate of the CIA. I graduated at the top of my class. I got the um, presidential scholarship, and that's all to just set up the fact that when I graduated, I couldn't cook rice. So a, a brief story. I went to um, work in a very fancy, beautiful Russian restaurant in New York City called The Firebird. And I, I got to the point where I was expediting, um, and I was running the kitchen. It was really exciting and was very, very, very busy. And we were slammed one night. We had um, a, um, a special on the menu. It was an Uzbekian lamb dish with a, um, a rice plov, which is a Russian rice dish, which has like 10,000 ingredients in it. And that was our rice for the night. <clears throat> Food runner came in to me and said, um, Sidney Poitier is here, and he would like some white rice. He didn't want the rice that we had on the menu. And I panicked, because I don't know how to cook rice. Is, <clears throat> what kind of rice do we have? Is it, it was always done during the day. Um, and I worked at night, so I, I, how, what kind of rice do we have? Is it short grain? Is it long grain? Is it parboiled? How, how much water do I use? How long does it cook for? How am I going to do this? And I suddenly looked over at the dishwasher, who in his spare time on slow nights would go up and cook his family recipes um, in the upstairs kitchen and bring them down for us to eat during breaks. And I looked at him and I said, in Spanish, very nicely, Arturo, please go upstairs and make rice for a very special guest of ours. Sidney Poitier went to a very fancy restaurant and had rice cooked by the dishwasher in a, in a kitchen full of chefs. So with that... Um, just wanted to add a little levity to what is a very serious um, subject and, and talk about chefs with, with PowerPoints. Unless I have something in front of me that I'm actually cooking, I'm kind of lost. So I am going to refer to my notes, so please um, forgive me. So I have in front of us um, uh, Chef William Lenway, who is a teaching specialist at the University of, of Minnesota. That's, that's Chef Bill in the middle. Todd, Chef Todd Seafarth is the director of the Culinary Nutrition Program at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. And last but not least, from my alma mater is Chef Brendan Walsh, who is the Dean of Culinary Arts at the Culinary Institute of America. Um, and I briefly want to just talk about the importance of our culinary educators' roles in, um, in the future of food in this country. Uh, so for too long, the nation's food service educators have been the unsung heroes of the U.S. food service industry. Collectively, they are chiefly responsible for shaping tomorrow's foodways by producing skilled, qualified culinary graduates who will make their mark on menus across the nation for decades to come. But no pressure. <laughs> Today, the immense value of food service educators is finally being recognized by the industry for the sheer power they possess. 
Recently, we at Enharvest launched a survey to approximately 450 food service instructors across the nation, asking for their insights on the opportunities and challenges of incorporating whole grains into their curricula. So we went out, did a survey monkey, and asked a whole bunch of questions and got some very, very interesting answers, which I am going to, uh, and it is an ongoing survey, I'm going to incorporate the, some of those uh, answers into our panel discussion um, and I'm just going to start with a couple before we get started with our presentations. Um, well, the first one was the word association. I say whole grains to you. Which grain immediately comes to mind? Any guesses what number one was? Wheat. Thank you. You're good at this. You must have, got, you, you must have gotten all the answers ahead of time. Um, and number two was quinoa. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and one of, the, one of the... I graduated from culinary school 20 years ago, and... When I, when I started thinking about when we were taught about whole grains, it was really only in a nutrition class that I, that I even heard about it, and was, which is probably why I couldn't cook rice when I left. Um, now, five to 10 years ago, nutrition is, um, the emphasis placed on teaching whole grains is about 39% in nutrition and 18% in cuisine. Um, and some said both, 43%. That was five to 10 years ago. Currently, Nutrition, 0%. It's not only taught in nutrition classes. Cuisine, 5%, and both 95%. So we're bridging, we're bridging the gap here, and that's, that's really important. And with that, I would like to, I don't know who wants to go first. Um, we're going to just learn a little bit about each, each um, culinary educator's programs, and then we'll go back to some questions. And the clicker is this? Yes. Okay. And I use it to check you. <laughs> so uh, there was a PowerPoint from Johnson & Wales. Outstanding. So my name is Todd Seaforth. I am a registered dietitian. I uh, started my career as a chef, uh, then um, started dating a vegan. Uh, one of the worst decisions I ever made. Uh, she decided that she was going to uh, go into a program called Culinary Nutrition. I started eating better because of her. I started exercising because of her. And I actually changed my major because of her. And I went into a little program called Culinary Nutrition, um, which is very unique. Uh, it's, it's offered at the Providence and the uh, Denver campuses of Johnson & Wales. We also have Johnson & Wales campuses in Miami and Charlotte as well. And what I want to kind of do, that was not the right button. Big green. Big green one, obvious. Big green one, bigger green one. Okay, so what I want to kind of talk about is the past and present uh, and the future of what our program is, and I want to talk about how we kind of approach whole grain education. Now, in the audience, you might be saying, well, why, why is this pertinent to me? Uh, one of two things, if, if you are involved with food service, uh, hopefully we are producing graduates that would have a skill set that you would find valuable. And if you are on the retail side, hopefully you have products that our students want to use in the future. So both ways, our education, I think, could help just about everybody in this room. Now, when we first started out, uh, my predecessor, a woman by the name of Suzanne Vieira, which it seems like I've never been in a room where somebody didn't know her, uh, Suzanne Vieira is probably the most tenacious dietitian I've ever met, and she was at a, um, a school where we had dietitians on faculty, we had chefs on faculty. Uh, she was very quickly learning that the field of dietetics was becoming more and more divorced from food. Uh, dietetics started out as a kind of a, a parallel to family consumer sciences, was very food oriented, and over the last 20 years or so, it's really become less and less about the food, more and more about the science, and more and more about the nutrition and the nutrients. So she was saying, well, why don't we create a program that trains chefs to be dietitians? And that's kind of where we started. And it was very unpopular when it first came out. Uh, it, was, it was something that, that people constantly were telling her, no, we're never, this program will never be at Johnson & Wales. But she fought and fought and fought. Uh, and then she got the program started up in 1999, 35 students in the original pilot program. Uh, and uh, very soon after starting it, I mean, we had, we had uh, obviously accreditation from our regional accreditor, but we didn't have the programmatic accreditation from what was then Katie, what is now Ascend, that would allow our program to be referred to as a didactic program in dietetics. Now, why that's important is that it allows our graduates to go off and become registered dietitians, which was something that was kind of unique about our program. We got very quickly uh, kind of pushed through it. We graduated our first class in uh, 2001, 
And when, uh, so we're, we're currently in our 17th year. And when we first started, we had a, the associate's degree, which was the bread and butter of Johnson & Wales at that point. We had an associate's degree in culinary arts. Then two years of culinary nutrition was built on there as a two plus two program. And uh, we put out about one third of our graduates pursued the registered dietitian credential at that point. Uh, about one third went after product research and development positions. Because uh, Katie, now Ascend, required food science in the program, uh, and every dietitian I've ever talked to says, oh, our food science class was baking soda biscuits. And they said, well, a culinary student is going to lose their mind if we do that. Let's actually put in some real product development, real food science. We actually had people who were hired on uh, right after, uh, in our first year, first year of graduation, being hired on at companies like Kraft and Heinz in kind of culinary innovation positions. But most of what we were doing is putting out focused uh, chefs that were really focused on health, healthy cooking and that kind of stuff. Now, uh, our program is, is foundation is food. So when we look at uh, some other uh, dietetics programs that have food focused, they tend to start with the nutrition first, and then they introduce more food than a typical program later on in their education, where we're very much, we're a culinary school. It's what we're known for. We have many, many degrees, but we have our, our core in culinary arts. So it's all about the food first. Then what we do is we introduce science, uh, food science, and then we also have a, a, a lot of really interesting faculty. This is uh, Chef John Poirot, uh, who took over, when I took over as the program director, he took over the performance nutrition class that I used to teach. Uh, he comes to us uh, with experience from the US Army. He was a dietitian that could cook with the Army. He got uh, embedded with special forces. Um, and he worked for, for several years actually cooking and working on, on performance nutrition for the, the soldier athletes. So coming, we, we have a, a very interesting uh, population of faculty. Uh, when we, we look at where our program has come over the last few years, uh, in 2007, Ascend, the, our accrediting body, changed their standards. They required more science. Uh, we also had uh, a introduction of an arts and science core, uh, which was a universal core of arts and science classes that all Johnson & Wales programs had to introduce. So what we ended up having to do is two years culinary arts, and then 1.57 years of culinary nutrition, and then we had concentration cl classes where people could become registered dietitian, and it was more of a focus on the product development at that point. And then it was kind of an even split along there. Then when we came into the arts and science core, we had to drop some of the classes that would qualify them for an associates. So it was basically, uh, we became a four-year program at that point. Now we look at where, um, where we're going. We, three years ago, I came on as the program director. We also had a new dean of the College of Culinary Arts come on. So we had new leadership. Uh, we had a self-study that we had to do for our accrediting body in 2013, and we also had uh, things like a PA program and a College of Health and Wellness that was introduced at Johnson & Wales. So what we're doing now is we are, in the fall of next year, we're going to have a four-year culinary science program that is going to be really strictly focused on product development, but it's still going to have a lot of the nutrition classes. We're going to have a four-year dietetics and applied nutrition, which will be housed out of the College of Health and Wellness. That will be our dietitian track. And then we're going to have a four-year integration integrated top to bottom uh, program that is going to be in culinary nutrition, which will teach hopefully the students uh, a lot of the things uh, that they're going to need to know to, to, to take advantage of a lot of the opportunities that are out there. And this has all been built with a common freshman experience so that the students that come into either culinary arts or culinary nutrition can actually pick and choose which, which direction they want to have after their freshman year. So it's built very intelligently top to bottom. Now, when we look at um, some of the things that are changing at Johnson & Wales, we have a physician's assistant program now. And I mean, most people don't know we have robotics, we have engineering, we have all these kinds of things. We also have physician's assistants. So this is uh, my new boss as, as of the fall. This is uh, Dr. George Bottomley, who runs the PA program. He's now the dean of the College of Health and Wellness. Um, and he, in the College of Health and Wellness, he now has uh, a mandatory culinary training course for all students that are coming through this program. So if you are studying health sciences, health promotion, anything like that, you have to take a mandatory healthy cooking class as part of it because food is now becoming a big part of being a proper clinician or a better clinician. Uh, we also have a minor in culinary arts. So if you do come to Johnson & Wales for robotics, you might be able to take a, a culinary arts minor. So not, not to work in a restaurant, but actually have a, a appreciable skills um, to impress your friends. Uh, we then have uh, some of the uh, food as medicine movement that we're taking advantage of where we have coupled with Tulane University in their medical school uh, under the, the tutelage and, and the vision of uh, Dr. Tim Harland at the Goldring Medical Center. And he uh, has uh, a program where he actually trains the public and future doctors on how to become more 
familiar with cooking. Uh, we send our students down there for an 11-week externship, so they actually work with working with doctors. And then we also have uh, about 12 students a year, give or take, uh, come up from Tulane University and take a four weeks very immersive program at Johnson & Wales. We actually have a new rotation starting yesterday uh, where they uh, come up and they spend four weeks just bouncing around. They do doubles, 12 hour days, classes in the morning, class in the afternoon for four weeks. And uh, what Tulane is showing is that incredible outcomes, better education on DASH diet, better education on, on um, uh, uh, allergies, better education on all these things. So it's really helping future doctors uh, on becoming more familiar with food. Another thing we've done is we couple with Brown University, and this is done more peer-to-peer uh, -peer students. Where Tulane is more for the fourth year, this is for the first year medical students. And Brown students come and they actually work with our students on how to, how to cook healthfully. And uh, this, we just were told, is the most popular elective in the medical school. Um, is coming to Johnson & Wales for a, it's five sessions of uh, didactic education, five sessions of culinary classes uh, with a practical at the end, and it's the most uh, exciting thing that's there. We also have an introduction of a nutrition across the curriculum, so if you're in a freshman uh, program, you're going to learn about whole grains, uh, even if you have no intention of learning anything about nutrition. Uh, on the baking and pastry side, we were talking about this earlier. When, when we were in school, um, when we were reading how to, be, how to make good bread, it was all about you can't use green flour. You have to use bromiated flour. This is how you make quality bread. And now what we see is that, that there's a lot of chefs that, out there that mill right in the classroom. And they use that, that milled grain that they use right in the classroom, introducing students. And we're making some of the best tasting bread I've ever had in my life. Um, and one of the people that uh, I work with, uh, Chef um, uh, Richard Miskovich, uh, would be a great panelist up here, too, talking about how baking and pastry is using more whole grains. Uh, this is a sophomore class that's, using, uh, that's making quinoa bowls. And again, when I was a student, in our senior class, we talked about cooking amaranth with juice and how that could become a, a, a layer in a parfait. I mean, that stuff, the students already come in knowing. So we, we are seeing a, an incredible evolution of this as we go through. Uh, so as we look at more uh, use of whole grains, we do see uh, it used from a culinary standpoint, trying to impress people. Uh, we do see it as an execution on the um, on uh, ethnic foods. We do see it a lot more in desserts, too, across. The, uh, and we, we, we see that the students are very passionate about it, very passionate about using it, and very excited about using it. So we look at the philosophy that's taught at, at, with whole grains, um, that it's important to under, that the student understands that it's not healthier because it's more expensive. So getting them to, to understand how to use the more, uh, uh, the more common uh, grains and cook them properly and make sure that they're incorporated into diet. Uh, we are very technique focused over recipe focused. Uh, we were talking earlier about how uh, different, uh, cooking one grain is not that much different from cooking another grain as long as you know the technique and how to alter it slightly. Uh, we are, uh, exposure to new ingredients makes people more curious. My background is in sports dietetics, so I work with a lot of uh, NC2A teams. And it's amazing how many 18-year-old kids won't touch something because they can't pronounce the grain that's in there. So utilizing different ways to hide it and get this, the trick, and I hate using that word, but tricking the, the people into eating it. We also see that uh, it's important, and we, we saw this all throughout today and I'm sure yesterday as well, is that the whole grains act as a vehicle for other flavors and components. Uh, moderation in everything. We, we, grains serve a major purpose in getting certain vitamins and certain minerals, obviously fiber, but we do see that, that incorporation of nuts and herbs and vegetables and fruits in there with it is, is very important to have a nice, well-rounded diet. So we're trying to get them to understand that it's not just a big pile of quinoa, that's not healthy, but it, it's, it's part of the bigger picture. Um, so I don't know if questions better now or later. I think in order to get everybody in, um, I know we're running a little late. Why don't we um, maybe continue? Are you done? I'm done. Okay, well, we'll continue with Chef Lenway. And that'll be the University of Minnesota PowerPoint, please. All right, well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, so just a quick little background about me that uh, doesn't really show up in the bio, too. Um, I started out with culinary. That was my main career. Then I actually, in 1996, I took a little trip out to Hyde Park, New York, attended the Culinary to America, uh, took some class out there, got into the whole idea of nutrition, nutritious cuisine, um, and then came right back and started up at the University of Minnesota. Currently, I'm just about done with my uh, PhD. Um, anyways... So I got the culinary background, then I kind of transferred into science, and also somewhere earlier on, I was actually going to school for art too, so I just got kind of a weird little bit of a background there. So uh, I know we gotta keep things moving along, so we're gonna do a fast and far-west presentation. 
there goes the baguette race car, a little baguette burnout there. So just three things I want to go over. Why research chefs? Uh, results from our first study because of the University of Minnesota. Um, we're not just doing traditional nutrition and, and uh, food science uh, research. We're also working with culinary and chefs here too. And then some ongoing research. So uh, what I always like to tell people, uh, and I know some of this is repeat and just reinforcement, you know, calculus is this language of physics. So food really is a language of nutrition. We can talk about nutrients, but until we can actually get people to eat things and enjoy it and want those things, um, it's uh, nutrition is an uphill battle. So I really like where the, basically where the rubber meets the road, um, that type of approach. Um, we take a look at industry. A lot of uh, research going with industry versus chefs. Um, I believe very strongly in educating, uh, you know, I have culinary students because I teach culinary, I teach food science, I teach uh, nutrition too. Um, well, we're an industry of many layers, change is slow and calculated, uh, it doesn't move very uh, quickly, but uh, you know, with chefs, we're, they're free to experiment, I mean, every day is, you've got specials, things like that. Change is required to be competitive. Uh, there are a few papers on chefs and what they do, too. Um, Ottenbach had a good one there. Uh, in industry, of course, large investments, you need new equipment, you need new facilities, you need new materials, but chefs, they're going to be given a material and then they learn a new skill. So having this information, the ability or this transfer information could be crucial there, too. Um, beyond even just culinary school, also professionals too. And then in industry, do you like to gamble? You're looking at big bucks. Uh, probably not, right? Uh, whereas uh, chefs are, independent chefs are valued for their innovation. Um, you can look at the chef not so much as an artist or even as a designer because we're making a product. Um, even though we call it culinary arts, we're really making a product to be sold, to appeal. There's a bit more calculation that goes into that. And chefs are informal researchers. They already do research independently, uh, almost unconsciously, subconsciously, that there's informal research going on. You have uh, demographics. You have to know what your demographic is before you open a restaurant. You have to know who your customers are. Customer interviews, get out in the dining room, talk to people before, after meals, you know, get feedback. Uh, I was a really big proponent, still am, of getting out there, being visible, talking to people, get feedback. Good, honest feedback's good, uh, whether it hurts your feelings or not, right? Um, and then focus groups, too. You, you have your staff meals, you have friends, you have family, but, you know, as chefs, you're always trying new things with that little focus group. We already do that, just not as formally. Uh, so why independent chefs? We research uh, sorry, specifically independent chefs. Um, with small restaurants, a lot of flexibility. If you take a look at, uh, you know, finally 2014, away from home, uh, food spending surpassed uh, what we spend on our food at home. So it's an obvious trend, but we're not just targeting uh, chefs because we feed people a certain amount of money's worth of food. Uh, there's a trend going on there, but even more importantly, in my opinion, is uh, this diffusion innovation. So it was kind of funny, my master's thesis, I have this... Uh, reference from the 1960s, but because it's still pretty solid stuff. So Roger Diffusion Innovations, think about, uh, you know, when, when the iPod came out, you know, MP3s, you know, so you have these, uh, these innovators come up with new ideas, and then uh, the early adopters are the first ones to buy those big clunky iPods when they first came out, and then you have some people that are still listening to CDs, some people are still listening to cassettes, and then you have a few people that are still listening to 8-tracks at that time, too, if you can even find an 8-track player, but these uh, products are most, uh, you, it's most feasible to start your production once it's climbed up that row a little bit. But industry keeps trying to get more toward this innovation side, trying to branch out a little bit, going with smaller, flexible things. And that's why I think chef, uh, chefs are really, really valuable. Um, so I'm really thrilled about uh, the focus on that. Chefs gives unique uh, new ideas. Authenticity, that was brought up in a previous presentation too, um, multiple times actually in a few of the presentations. It's great perspective. Uh, our perspective on health as dietitians might be different from a chef's perspective on health, or, uh, for example, the Native American perspective of health, too. We've done some research at the University of Minnesota where we actually went in and with our agenda of health and offended people because there are different definitions of health, and you really have to be sensitive to that. Uh, I think it's a really important point moving forward. Uh, one of my advisors uh, did some work there that was pretty interesting, too. Uh, take a look at how you train chefs, hands-on practical. You put a chef, uh, a culinary student into a classroom for lecture, sometimes it's difficult, right, to teach them food service math or to teach them nutrition in a lecture setting. When you can get them working with food, that's really advantageous. 
And how do we train dietitians? How do you train food scientists? You're looking at calculations and details and uh, you know, a lot of book work, but what about getting them back into those other skills of actually handling food, of being able to give cooking classes as dietitians really want to beef that experience up. At the U, we're trying to, get, uh, we're trying to encourage our, our food science students, nutrition students to take culinary classes too and get a certificate we've worked out with a local culinary school. Um, and then there's substitution versus manipulation. Uh, a lot of the times in food science, you have a product and then you are trying to manipulate the ingredients, whereas a chef's going to work the opposite way, give them something, and they're going to basically uh, grow something out of that. Um, or traditionally, sometimes we take and we substitute a whole grain. It's like, well, what do we do? Well, we substitute in whole wheat. We substitute in whole wheat. We substitute in whole wheat. Uh, but we need to manipulate that whole wheat. So chefs give us a unique uh, perspective from that, too. And there's this really cool concept called functional fixedness. And so it tends to use objects only for traditional purposes as opposed to finding new uses uh, to solve a problem. So what is the problem to get whole grains out? To why, you know, why aren't we rethinking different ways to use these grains? So there are a lot of different uh, areas of potential there. A uh, little research study here. This is my master's project, basically. Looking at use berries opportunities for serving whole grains, we looked at local independent chefs, did interviews just to get a real wide-reaching, um, you know, basic starting point to launch this uh, further research. I'm just going to touch over a few of these. I want to make this fast and far out as I can. Uh, so in menu design, not specific to whole grains, we asked chefs, what are factors in menu design? Number one factor with our chefs was availability. What do we have available? Um, secondarily, consumer demand. The demographics. So number one is basically what's, what's available, what can they get in, right? So sometimes you wait until there's a demand and then make the products available. So this is just caused a little bit of a roadblock here. Uh, getting those products out there to chefs, they will use it. You give it to them and I, I promise you they will find a way to use it and make it interesting. Uh, other things that were mentioned, variety and balance, which as we know, very important parts of nutrition, variety and balance. Um, factors related to chef or establishment type, you know, is it a certain uh, demographic that goes to the restaurant or a theme, things like that. Prices, um, we'll talk about advantages, but prices and advantage of whole grains because whole grains are cheap when you compare it to fish or cheese, meats, things like that. Uh, it's a great basis for that plate, basically you stretch it out, think about, you know, a steak versus beef stew, right? You stretch that out by adding other things like vegetables or grains in there. Uh, and then health uh, actually did come up multiple hits in our interviews that uh, chefs are concerned about health for themselves and for their customers. They don't want to kill people off, you know? Nobody wants that, right? So one other thing they mentioned was a need to promote grains as a Midwest local food. Since we base this in Minnesota in the Twin Cities, um, the you, in colder climes, you take a look at what is local food. Well, you're going to have to have some things that are dried or, or such to carry you through the winters. Um, so really wanted to promote that idea of grain being local food, but it's hard to find local grain growers. Um, some whole grain advantages. First off, chefs love the sensory attributes. So whereas in food science, we're trying to tone things down. Chefs wants to ramp it up a little bit and use these attributes to make something uh, you know, hearty instead of calling it healthy. Sometimes they call it hearty, right? Um, secondarily, health qualities. Uh, so we all know that whole grains, you know, have certain health qualities and so do our customers. And uh, as an example, the bowls are very popular for that reason. People are looking for vegetables and things with that too. Also then cost is an advantage in adding variety and balance, different textures, colors, flavors. Um, Whole grain disadvantages, uh, one of the tough ones was uh, consumer issues. I was pretty impressed with the idea of the uh, fusion, the, uh, um, the uh, you know, build your own sushi that, you know, kids are getting over this kind of food neophobia. So even adults have this food neophobia sometimes, you know, you even look at a kid's menu, it's yellow, right? So getting some variety in there is helpful. Uh, or having the wrong demographics. So people go to a restaurant for a certain reason. Maybe they're going for entertainment, not so much for health. So be careful with that. Needs that chefs identified to build consumer demand and awareness, get them to try things, see things, hear things in the news, uh, what's going on the East Coast, what's going on the West Coast. Uh, it takes a while to diffuse its way in, especially to Minnesota, right? Um, then needs uh, also to provide info, uh, demos for chefs, information for chefs, which is out there, but trying to get that, you know, a little bit, a little more concentrated, plus make sure they don't end up on some weird, you know, websites that, you know, wiki how to cook or something. Uh, and then history, chefs mentioned history as being a really important part of these grains. We talk about ancient grains, we talk about the history or the story behind 
food? What makes Kobe beef so special? What makes quinoa so special? What makes amaranth so special? What makes millet so special? If you talk about a staple grain that moved from India to China, through Japan, how these things uh, have a history and a personality. This is an important part of uh, marketing for them. Uh, so ongoing uh, research that we're looking at here, just wrapping up, uh, we're trying to really get into the chef's creative process by giving them grain products and then working with what's going on, using them as their own research of what's going on in your head as we build these products. Um, how these things can transfer the teaching students and professionals in food science, nutrition, and culinary. So think about, you know, what chefs do, how we can use that to train food scientists or nutritionists or um, culinary students, right? So basically, what do chefs value? How can we transfer that back into reinforcing what culinary students are going to uh, need to be successful in promoting uh, health through their food, for instance, with whole grains? And then how these processor models can actually help, for instance, SNAP participants. You have a very limited budget, limited variety. Uh, variety is a good thing. Uh, my internship, uh, we did a week of... Um, living off of SNAP dollars, basically. We try to get variety. Some of the interns are just like, well, I'll just buy ramen noodles, put frozen veg, that's dinner every night, right? That's probably not a good way to live. So using some of these skills to transfer to get more variety and more ideas and more creativity into food uh, could really be helpful, too, on the wide scale. So even it, this research could affect people who aren't primary customers of restaurants. So this has a lot of potential in training culinary students and chefs and food scientists too uh, in this way. So there we go. Okay. Nobody cares about references though, right? <laughs> Details. All right. We believe you. Yeah, just believe me. <laughs> Chef Walsh from the Culinary Institute of America is next. Hi, everyone. I want to thank everyone for staying for our last session. I really appreciate that. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to stay through this entire conference, and um, the lead-up to our presentation is pretty self-evident. Um, I think that uh, the presentations this morning led to the importance of the chef and how um, the chef is in can really influence uh, food and food changes in our world and um, using whole grains and getting them incorporated is something that is, leads up to a absolutely everything that we're doing. So I'm, I'm listening to my partners here up on stage and they've led us up into what's happening in culinary education. In culinary education there is so many things going on. Food is a topic of conversation that is monumental from so many different fronts. So I am very, very blessed by being the Dean of Culinary Arts at the Culinary Institute of America, where for years they, um, this beautiful little campus, and I get to look over that beautiful view so it's not too shabby, but for years this was a school that was built off the GI Bill. So it was for returning vets. It was a skills-based school. Um, and of course it took two women to get that together. Just a shout out for women. Um, our founders were um, uh, the president's wife from Yale, and they, they put together this idea and got the GI Bill formed so that GIs could come back and have good working jobs. Well, that skill base still continues on. It's something that's very foundational in our system. But what we're building now is this kind of idea around leadership for the future. Um, our, I know that we're responsible for approximately 1,300 students that are going to enter into the food service professions in many different arenas. And food systems is a big topic of conversation. So this, this is an area where chefs are making a difference. As you've listened throughout this conference, the difference that chefs are making in terms of food, food systems, and what we can do, and creatively making these things happen. So, we have campuses that are spread around the world, and I'll quickly go through it. St. Helena, California, for a reason, we're out there, and we're out in grape growing, so we have concentrations and great courses all around um, continuing education. We just um, acquired Copia, which is going to have one of the largest museums um, of food products in the world, and um, uh, we can continue to do continuing education and two-year program out here and concentrations around farm to table and also around um, wine studies. 
and what a great place to be able to go to. If you ever get a chance to go to a conference there, definitely do it. In San Antonio, we focus on Latin cuisines and Latin flavors. I think Stephen kind of set me up a little bit for this. The importance of flavor profiles in food, because I've heard this word bantered a little bit this last few days, about craveability. If the food isn't delicious, it's going to be a real problem moving it along. So I think everyone's in agreement on that. So using world flavors is a great opportunity for us to introduce grains in a lot of different ways. So in San Antonio, we focus a lot on Latin cuisines. We just finished a conference there um, that brings around thought leadership in Latin flavors. In Singapore, we house a campus uh, there, and we have an Asian studies concentration that goes on out there. So that brings more of those international flavors into the mix. So our students are diversified. They're going all the way through the system. I think it's really important. The only thing I want to say is we have a very diverse student body. And they're worldwide. So they're, they're going to make influences not just in the United States, but around the globe. And it, for me, faculty is key. I mean, my students are really, really important. But at my level, what's really important is my faculty. What am I doing? Because you know, you heard the old adage, and by the time you graduate from college, what you learned is going to be diminished or you know, pretty much kaput by the time you're in your fifth year, which is very depressing considering the cost. But um, uh, so with that knowledge, I know that my faculty has to be trained up all the time. And that's one of the reasons I attend conferences such as this. Last week, I was at Monterey Bay Aquarium, where I want to do a shout out to everyone in this room. If you don't have the Seafood Watch app, please get it so we can take care of our oceans. I'd really appreciate that. But our faculty need to be trained up, and they need to be constantly trained. It's not something that you do something, you teach them, they get into a box, and that's all they're teaching our students. So training up the faculty is huge, and I've talked to a few people in here about opportunities to create more um, relationships. Because our relationship building, our collaboration, has been huge and has been effective in creating some incredible alumni. But it's also, we know that food is so, so important. Food matters. We know that, and my belief system is that every single person should have a culinary education. They should have culinary education, but it should be starting earlier in their life. It should be starting in K through 12, because you eat 365 days a year. So we know food matters. And we know that our food choices are having an astronomically important effect on our planet. So, for me, this is a, it's a very personal conversation, but it's also um, you know, a very important conversation for our school and for culinary leadership. I think that you have heard some of the same things from the panelists before we got up here. But this was a fact that just kind of like threw me for a loop and said, man, we got to move. we got to change some things. When you look at obesity, when you look at the diabetes problems, et cetera, this was just a little piece that I saw. Just the the homegrown produce, 131 pounds a year, down to 11 pounds a year over 100 years. Increase in sugar, sugar soda, meat production up, our overall caloric intake. So the fact that chefs need to be more involved with these questions is really important. But it's also about eating and ethics. It's about how do we look at this from an ethical point of view? Because every time I eat something has to die, everything I eat takes resources. What I choose to eat reflects my values. What I choose to eat supports the people and food system I want to support. So these are big, important issues that we're staring down at the Culinary Institute of America and talking about. Environmental stewardship is extremely important to us. A big topic conversation throughout industry right now, and we're um, uh, doing a lot of work at the school on, is waste management. We know that 40% of our food is wasted. We know that equals an incredible amount of wasted water. And we know that water, we turn on a faucet, so we're kind of disconnected. But I live in a small town in Connecticut, which has actually had four pumps go dry. On the eastern seaboard, we're actually having some water issues. So it's not something that we should be disconnected from. We need to connect to the resource management. So we know that from data, you know, we, it's not anecdotal. We know that the data is telling us our relationship to health. And we know that whole grains is an important part of that. We know that we need to consume less meat. As a matter of fact, about a week ago, it came out, I think it was the Harvard Medical School, put out a note about how the FDA won't say it, but that there is de definite correlations between meat um, overage of meat consumption and cancer. So we know that these things are very important. We know that our oceans are, are in trouble, so we need to keep an eye on it. We know that aquaculture is an opportunity for us to be looking at. We need to stare at it. And we know that we can do a lot better by eating more plant-based foods. 
So when I look at it from my perspective as a dean, I know that these are things that I need to inculculate throughout my faculty who will then be, um, you know, there'll be more of a common message that'll be going to all of our students that are going out into the field and making a difference. So we know that industry is going after this incredibly. We know for a fact that industry is saying, if we're not on board this, we're going to lose out because there is this social consciousness that's going on with the, you know, the millennial generation. So what I'm watching is, for example, I sent out a quick note to my, a um, couple of my nieces and nephews and my kids and said, do you feel an ethical responsibility to, about what you eat? And every one of them replied to me and said, yes, not just from a, you know, a resource piece, but also from a, um, you know, a health perspective. They're very much more connected to their food than I think we give them credit for. And we need to understand that. Their information base is so vast. They can get information so much quicker than we were able to in my generation. So that information is in them. They know a lot more. But you can't bore them with that information. You need to keep them to be able to be stimulated. Food can be stimulating. We need to make it exciting and tasteful, and they can stay connected to it. And that's why you're seeing that, like, um, the gentleman that presented this morning from, what was it, B Foods? What was it? No, Be Good. Be Good. Unbelievable presentation, unbelievable trends going on from the East Coast to the West Coast. And you saw what's happening in the middle of our country with fusion. So this is a huge chain. I drove my motorcycle across this country in 1988, and you got lettuce and tomato salad. And you got a steak. The change in our food across this country is amazing, and what's happening is very beautiful. So the change is going on. And industry needs to be p paying attention to this, otherwise they're gonna lose a huge base. So you've got these big groups such as Compass, a shout out to Compass for mentioning menus of change. Um, uh, Compass group who has all these food service operations all across the country that are very focused on what these issues mean and what, it, what it'll say. That's a real positive for anyone that's in the whole grains business. So if you're selling whole grains, you have a very, very positive outlook. So menus have changed, just real quick, is a collaboration that started really with um, Harvard Medical School and the CIA. And um, what they did is they took the, the latest science and data research, working with Walter Willett, David Eisenberg, and they, they created these tenants that were, um, were accepted by many, many, many schools. I'll go on to that a little bit more. But You'll see at the top on the um, right over there, it says make whole and attack grains the new norm, limit potatoes, um, seafood, red meat less often, et cetera. So these were all data-based tenants, and they measure themselves every year how they are doing in each one of these areas. And this is industry coming together with doctors, with the CIA, with a bunch of different schools. Now, it's gone one step further. So now we have this thing called the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. I'm very proud to be a part of that executive committee. And in that executive committee, it's about collaboration of many different colleges. We have 135 colleges that have committed to the principles of sustainable menus. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal news. That's great. That's great opportunities for our students. That's unbelievable opportunity for culinarians to go out into the field and have many more diversified job opportunities. And so that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm a part of. It's very exciting to be in my position because, like I said, food matters. There's so many great things going on. Um, and uh, you know, from a, from a health perspective, we have a conference called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, which um, brings together doctors, dietitians, and nutritionists, brings them around the table with chefs, and they talk, and they teach, and they learn from each other. And now you're seeing a lot of concierge services where they're hiring chefs in doctor's office to teach um, you know, their patients about how to cook good food at home. So unbelievably positive things going on in the field. And that's just a, like a little quick summation. You've got plenty of other things to talk about. But thank you very much. Thank you. So that was a great overview of these um, really incredible, um, thank you, programs. But how do we make this happen? We, we have these, these grains that we want to be bringing out into the world for so many very important reasons. We've heard some incredibly innovative um, ideas from, from people, from um, 
uh, all of the examples that were, that were just brought up. How do we cook them? How are we teaching kids how to cook kids, however old they are? How are we teaching people how to cook these grains? I recently um, went to San Diego's Unified School District, which is a very large school district. They have many, many, many schools, various types of um, cooking equipment. Some of it's broken, some of it's not. Um, and, and they called me down there to, to teach their central kitchen manager how to cook rice. So I wasn't the only one who didn't know how to cook rice. Now, fortunately, I do. Um, and so I went down with our, one of our grain blends, and we cooked it on the stovetop, a two-pound sleeve, on the stovetop, in the combi oven, in the steamer, um, and in a, in a flat oven. And because they needed to know all of these different methods for all of their various school um, situations and formats. So uh, let, me ask, let me ask Chef Seaforth, um, we talked about this this morning. What, how, are you teaching, how are you teaching kids how to cook whole grains? Or students, let me say students. Well, in the, Intact <clears throat> grains. So in, in the, at the freshman level, we're, we're looking at strictly techniques. So we, we typically look at uh, the pilaf method versus the, um, the risotto method. Why uh, certain grains, if you look at the amylose to amylopectin ratios and how one will typically be more sticky versus one will be more fluffy. How to choose the right grain for your application. So trying to get them to understand that not all, all grains have benefits, but not all grains are built equally, how to use the right technique for them, um, how to compensate for liquid. So one of the things that, that we, we are looking at uh, introducing into the, um, into the curriculum somehow is I've always thought that a grain needs a certain ratio of water. So the, whatever it happens to be. And Cooks Illustrated a, a few months ago came out with this, this idea where they tested a whole bunch of different grains, but they were in closed systems. So they, they used like a sous vide technique. They put them in a, a bag and then boiled them and showed that all grains, they did take different times to cook, but all grains took a one-to-one -one ratio, which blows my mind and shows us that we have a lot more to learn. Uh, but these are some of the things that we need to teach the students is that, that there is a technique. And if I know how to cook farro, I know how to cook quinoa, and it's just a matter of just trying to tweaking it. And I think your point of, of cooking it differently in a steamer versus in a combi versus a, 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 an oven uh, or on the, on the stovetop is very important for them to understand how the technique has to, even though the, the, the general tenets are the same, the, the, the actual technique needs to be altered versus, uh, because of uh, cooking time, heat transfer method, all that different kind of stuff. Yeah, and even when you just get into quinoa, white quinoa takes a little bit less time yeah. to cook than a red quinoa, which takes even less time to cook than a black quinoa. So still can't get the students to understand that wheat berries are going to take a really long wheat time. Wheat berries are going to take a long time. You so got to put them on early. If they're not, if they're if they're intact whole grains and they have not been pearled. Um, let me ask Chef Walsh. I know where grains were in the curriculum when I was a student at the Culinary Institute of America. Where, where are they showing up now? Is it, a, is it in cuisine, cultural cuisines, or is it, you, you tell me. Well, I, you know, we have um, uh, cuisines and cultures of the world, and, and there's a lot more in depth, but just basic techniques, such as understanding um, basic grain cookery is happening in the fundamentals class. I want to just mention something that um, I think is really important is, you know, when we, when we talk about ancient grains and old ways, that doesn't mean that we can't incorporate technology. And it was really good to see earlier this little note about rice cookers. Um, I was a chef for the longest time. I wouldn't use a rice cooker. A chef has to feel it, smell it, touch it. You know, what would you do with a rice cooker? Until I used it for the first time, and then I realized how dumb I was for not using a rice cooker all that time. Um, so a rice cooker is just an unbelievable opportunity to be cooking grains. Once you know the ratio, you press a button and you turn it on. There's pressure cookers for um, uh, electric rice cookers that are phenomenal, cook right, brown rice in under 20 minutes. So why would we not use that technology? I think that's extremely important conversation. I think we didn't touch on it enough. In grain cookery, that is an area where we can help people incredibly. So, you know, we're talking at a little higher level here. But when I was teaching, I taught this um, initiative with Harvard Medical School. And we were trying to teach people about diet change. They were pre-diabetic. And none of them wanted to deal with whole grains because of time constraints. That was a big issue. So if you don't talk about the time piece, and the way you can talk about the time piece is through technology. Pressure cookers are inexpensive. 
You can, they're so easy to use at this stage that you could be cooking things, uh, keeping nutritional value, not pouring away all the juice and straining it off or anything like that, and having these unbelievably di dishes that are cooked in under 30 minutes. Unbelievable dishes. So I think that's a really, really important conversation to have around grains, and that's one of the things that we're trying to incorporate earlier in the program, because it's a resource management piece, too. So you're using one-third the resource, okay, so less energy, more nutritional value, so I think that's extremely important. Um, less energy, more nutritional value, I don't need to say more. There's one other piece, but I'm spacing out because I'm old. But that's, I think that's an important piece. Yeah, there's a lot to consider. That's very insightful, thank you. Um, our, our survey that we referred to um, asked the following question. Are certain cultures, cuisines taught in your curriculum more conducive to featuring whole grains? If yes, which? The number one was Middle Eastern, number two, South American, Latin, and number three, Mediterranean. Chef Lenway, you, we talked a little bit about regionality, um, and can you, can you address where in your curriculum, um, whether it's um, regional American or whether it's um, in a particular cuisine that you touch on, on grains a little more than others? Yeah, we don't really touch on whole grains a lot in the American regional. Um, and we do look at you know other areas because we've been you know around the world these grains have been used for a very long time, you know don't reinvent the wheel and they have certain applications and qualities and there's an authenticity there too and a lot of the times when we're being creative as chefs we take something that's already been done and then we add a personal touch or a little flair or a twist or we do fusion you know like hot zone foods things like that and so. Uh, we tend to cover that in other countries other than the U.S. Um, I guess uh, you know a large part of it is you know what are some what are some traditional U.S. whole grain applications versus in other countries. So uh, we have you know a lot of we concentrate on Latin. We of course we concentrate on nutrition too, and something we try to do in nutrition is try to get out of that functional fixedness. So buckwheat, you know what was it traditionally used for? You can make you know the kasha or you can roast it, grind it, use it for breading on something, and then bake it onto chicken, um, something of that sort, too. So trying to break out of that mold, too. So there is a traditional application, uh, more so in other cultures than, the, than, than you know, like the American regional. Uh, but then we also try to break out different applications. But a lot of it, too, is experiencing uh, different flavors from around the world and then bringing that home. Yeah, that makes it easy when it's already been, as you say, it's invented. It's been done. It's been perfected through right. Why know, would informal we research it? for generations. So. Yeah. So let's talk about where um, you're training your students to um, to uh, bring these whole grains into um, the workplace. So uh, another question from from our survey. Um, please write the following industry segments. Well, let me just give you the top industry segments that offer the greatest opportunities to add dishes or applications featuring whole grain. So number one was fine dining. So it's still, it's still leading the way, according to the, the people we talked to. Number two, casual mid to upscale. Um, number three, colleges and universities, which is pretty great, I think. Uh, number four, prepared foods. We, we heard a lot about prepare, prepared foods and grocery today, grocerants. And fast casual, we've certainly heard a lot about that. So um, I'm just going to throw this out to all of you. Where um, are, do, you, do, you teach, do you teach the students to, that this is going to be the best place to, to, put, to, in, to incorporate the whole grains? Is there one place over another, Chef Walsh? I, don't, I just don't agree with that survey, as i got to have to say, <laughs> because you're talking about fine dining is less than 10% of your total market share. So you, you're really going to make it a profound effect, and you're seeing it being done by chefs in the fast food segment. So you're seeing people like Susan Finnegar, Rick Bayless, et cetera, where they're in airports, they're in food service all over the place, and you're talking about thousands and thousands of people every day. So if you want to make a huge impact, I think that's where it is. Not in the 10% market of high fine dining in, in whole grains. I just, think that just speaks and, to the perception rather than what's actually yeah, happening. Yeah, and I think, I think it's an important conversation because I was actually having this conversation with Susan, and she was saying that you know she, this is an unbelievable field and an unbelievable opportunity to do really good, tasty, interesting flavors, but you just need to know how to work in that system. So it's a different kind of way of thinking about it. So I think that's a great opportunity for people that are in that, that are thinking about um, whole grains and where they can put them. Yeah. 
Um, well, let's touch briefly. I want to open this up to questions. Um, I know we're, everybody has to go to the airport. I do. Um, but let's talk about your baking programs. Do you, where are you using um, intact grains? So is it specifically um, uh, it, uh, folding them into, cooking them and folding them into doughs? Are you, we, we talked about r rye and how soaking rye berries, and we alluded to that a couple of times. And, and any of you can answer that. Where, where are whole grains in your baking programs? I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to talk yeah. about that. Lewis, we have a two-year baking pastry program, so it's, there's a lot of focus around it. Um, our, in our pastry program, we're, we're milling different grains into different flours and incorporating them into breads, so they're studying that and uh, working with the students on that. You know, we also have this bakery that we're selling wholesale, so yeah. you know, we can understand market also. Yeah. What sells, what doesn't sell, so that's a really interesting perspective. And we service, we have four restaurants. We service all four of those restaurants through it. So we're doing sprouted grain work yeah. and um, uh, milled work, which I think is the hot topic, is you know, how you're going to fresh mill and go right to breads. Um, and very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Chef Seaforth, yeah. do you have something to well, add? Well, we, we, we see it as just, just in the time that I've been at the university, <clears throat> where, where the bread that was walking down the hallway to go to a dining room class or to go to someplace else was always the baguette, it was always the ciabatta, the, these are the popular things. And now, it, if you want a baguette, you have to wait several days and you have to go seek it out when somebody's actually making it. The artisan bread work is something that the faculty are much more passionate about, something that the students are much more passionate about. And I, I remember watching a, a, a video um, when the, uh, the whole grains uh, came out in the school uh, in, in school food service, and there was YouTube clips of these people saying, "Oh, I don't want that brown bread. I don't want that. That's gross. That's not going to fill me up." And now we have a bunch of students that that just crave it, and it's it's one of those things where we're looking back to your previous question. If we if we don't look at whole grains as being this special magical thing that you have to put into there, but we just use them, and then it just becomes commonplace to use them either as a part or the entirety of it. I think that's one of the ways that we're approaching it too. And don't say healthy. Kiss the death. Well, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Say good. Chef Lim, would you have something to yeah, add? Yeah, and one other thing, too, that we uh, do look at is going beyond, uh, you know, once again, the functional fixedness or, you know, traditional uses. I mean, we'll use whole grains in, say, sprouted red rice uh, pudding or a whole grain uh, bread pudding or teff in a pie crust or use teff in angel food cake. You can make a gluten-free version. It doesn't rise quite as well, but what are the qualities of that teff? And so using some different flours, using some different uh, grains, but in you know non-baking type desserts too, trying to get some of that variety out too. And I really just try to let students just go wild with their ideas. It doesn't always turn out well, but that's part of learning. That's, that's all about the mistake. Um, well, really innovative stuff going on, and I just want to open it up to the to the audience now. I just wanted to say, as a Compass Group employee and a graduate of Johnson and Wales, the juxtaposition of Compass and Sodexo, and now Jay Wu and the CIA on the same stage together. This is my first conference. Whoever wrote the schedule and got everyone to come, this was incredible. <laughs> yeah. I heard Colleen and Chef William mention that they went to the CIA. I was Johnson and Wales. Chef Safarth was one of my Hi, instructors. Andrew. He was an absolute rock star. And not only in class, but at night, he would do mystery baskets. And we would use ingredients left over from all the classes and really open up and have opportunities to touch and cook things and, and experience things that was definitely above and beyond. So thank you for that personally and really awesome stuff. Thank you all. Thank you. Ditto. I wanted to just thank you. This is our first conference, brand new members to the Whole Grain Council. Though I'm a food scientist, I'm a, a mom, and for 25 years, we started a business 25 years ago of teaching people, home users, homemakers, the importance of freshly milling their flour. So we sell a grain mill and we sell whole grains, but one of the dilemmas is they're eating healthy at home, they can't go out to eat. So this has been very, very exciting for us to be here and see the trends that are happening. And um, I do tell people whole grains are healthy, so I teach them all about that and the sicknesses they're experiencing could be from not eating more whole grains. But this, is, this has been very exciting and just to see the trends that are moving and that we can now eat out and not have to compromise what we're doing at home. So thank you. Thank you for putting this on.
Thank you so much. Chef Walsh, I just want to talk to you, please, because I thought your point was really well made. And there is a discussion that needs to be made or had among um, culinary educators. And that is, um, my understanding is that, uh, well, the three of you are like thought leaders within the culinary education realm. I don't know how representative you are of the nation's culinary education population. In other words, culinary educators in a, a culinary educator in a community college in Winnemucca, Nevada, right? I don't know if, if that educator would have the same um, insights as, say, one of you. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just I think there are a lot more of them than of you. And here's my point. When we say that in the survey that uh, a, a large number of respondents said the, the number one opportunity in 2017 is in the realm of fine dining, you know, I think you have to look at the fact that educators are, are the pastry chefs of 20 years ago still. Even though more and more of the world of the industry is starting to recognize the power that you all have, they are not the folks who get um, Nation's Restaurant News trickling down to them. They don't, always get to, they don't always get to know what the trends are nationally. And so it, it could be their perception is still way off, regardless of the airport kiosks, regardless of the pop-up restaurants that are everywhere. Not everybody is as aware as you, is what I'm saying. And that's why I think the larger con conversation has to be that the educators themselves need to be educated. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think what we miss often is the boots on the ground relationship. And that's why I brought up the faculty early. If, if we don't up train our faculty on a consistent basis, we're missing a huge connection point because then we don't get the boots on the ground. So in industry right now, we're stuck with a model, a model that has been there that is based off of a very kind of old way of looking at cooking. And that is slowly going to change, and it is changing. You heard it. This whole conference was about how that's changing. Yeah. So um, I, the thing is, uh, on, the, uh, on the culinary educator piece, there was a lot of non-accredited schools that were in the culinary education business. So I don't think they look at it as holistically as a Johnson & Wales would, or a Kendall, or et cetera. I think that that is an important conversation. So a, a, our program is not cheap. It's expensive as heck. But we're not putting 250 students into a ballroom. You know, we have 15, 16 students in a classroom with expensive um, um, food items, with expensive technology, the equipment alone you can imagine, all right? So it's a real challenge for us to move that ball at these, we need to, so we're thinking heavily about how do we keep our costs down and still educate the future population to change that food system. It is a, an incredible conversation that needs to be ongoing, but it's changing. We saw it. Very positive. So I have very positive feelings walking away from here. Yeah, I would also have you look at the agendas of, uh, of the RCA, look at uh, Research Justice Association, International Association of Culinary Professionals, American Culinary Federation. Even on the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics side, uh, you look at the keynote speakers from the last few years. It was Ellie Krieger. It was um, uh, um, um, Anthony Bourdain. It was uh, Marcus Samuelson. This is the first year in, in four years that they haven't had a chef as a keynote at a diet dietitians conference. And then, so so it, this is one of those things where where it's out there. We're trying. And it's just a matter of if, if, if you are a culinary educator, but you don't care about culinary education, we're never going to get to you. So it would be then looking at the people, the administrators of these programs, and trying to get them to understand why it's important that somebody who's doing their little vocational certificate culinary program um, is supported properly uh, with faculty development opportunities, or is, is properly educated when they hire them in the first place on a lot of these trends that, that obviously are going to be a, a, a difference in the future. I have one other thought on that, too. I think that your students that you're training are going out, and even if they're not instructing at Winnemucca Community College, and I don't mean to pick on them, I don't know anything about them, but that's just the term Brent used, they're going to work in a kitchen with somebody that you graduated, and they're going to be watching and learning, and so what you are doing, even though it's not totally widespread yet, is going to have a huge impact. It doesn't happen overnight, but it, this is really, really huge. I remember we had uh, Suzanne Vieira speak at our 2006 or 2007 conference, and this was the first that I had heard that anybody was bringing nutrition and culinary skills together, and it was just very, very exciting. And again, I can see how far we have come since this, and I, I just applaud you up and down every day for for where you're taking this and what a difference it's gonna make. So thank you.
Well, if we don't have any more um, questions or comments, thank you all for staying late. Yeah, There's a you. rice cooker under every seat of the person who stayed, so thanks. <laughs> and thank you so much to the chef, pa uh, to the uh, culinary educator panel. It, it is um, always hard to be the last panel, and somebody always has to be, and we do appreciate your staying and our guests for staying. I had several people, and I know they're in this room, who said, this is one of the panels I'm really looking forward to. And uh, we're so glad that we were able to benefit from this. And the poor people who did have to catch their planes, we will have this on video. So they will still get it. And I'm sure many of them care. They just couldn't fit it into their schedules. So it's time to say goodbye. We want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of the speakers, to all the media who have been here for helping to spread the word. If the tree falls in a function room in Chicago and nobody hears it, what difference does it make? So we really need you working with us. We need to thank all our sponsors once again for helping to fund the conference so we could get you all here to the hotel for wonderful venue and good food, and especially to all the attendees for joining us. So go forth, make sure wherever you go to just ask for whole grains, and when you're in restaurants, and the more that restaurants are made aware of the demand and interest in whole grains, the more momentum we can create. There is a grab-and-go lunch waiting for you next door. Rosie, did you have something crucial that you have to say? Okay. I think everybody here would like to thank the Whole Grains Council and Old Ways for an incredible, as always, conference. So we have to thank you. And as I say, Kelly is the genius who put together this wonderfully diverse program and inspired all our speakers to take time out of their schedules to come here. So a special thank you to Kelly. Um, so you will re just to remind you, you will receive a very brief email tomorrow. We don't ask you to rate every aspect of the conf conference on a scale of 1 to 10. We just say, what did you like best? What can we do better next time that will help make the next one? And I know you're all hooked. You're all going to be there next time even better. So um, please do fill that out when you get it tomorrow. Thank you.